Hello, everyone. My name is Alex Dahl. I'm a grinding consultant based in Cork, Ireland. Today's presentation is talking about autogenous and semi-autogenous grinding systems, and it's prepared for the Vijay Ganaraya Sri Krishna Devaraya University in Bellary, India. The lecture notes for this presentation are available online. You can click the link down in the description and then download these notes yourselves and follow along as we carry on with the lecture. This is the second part of the lecture. If you haven't seen the first part of the lecture, click the link in the description area below and you can watch that before watching this video. Now that we've introduced some of the grinding circuits, I want to shift the talk towards modeling of comminution. And the reason why I want to talk about modeling is that we use empirical models configured for grinding circuits for the design of the grinding circuits and also to de-bottleneck and optimize grinding circuits. So is it completely necessary for you to know about modeling a SAG or an AG mill if you're just an operator of a, of a mill? The short answer is yes, if you want to run the mill well, because the models will give you a framework that you can, can load into your mind to describe what's going on, right? How do you interpret what you're observing? Well, you stick it into a model and then you see where those parameters are, uh, seem to be changing. Many of the concepts in modeling that, uh, kind of are disconnected to what operators are doing usually revolves around the power measurement. I'm not going to go too deep into this, but basically the DCS power that you will see on a control panel in a grinding circuit or in a, in a control room is usually something like the motor input power. And all of the models that I'm going to talk about are based on the power, the mechanical power measured at the shell of the mill. So there needs to be a conversion between the electrical motor input power and the mechanical power observed at the rotating shell of the mill. Okay, very important. Models are a simplified representation of reality that we can use to make predictions. Because they are a simplified representation of reality, they are wrong. All empirical models are wrong, but some of them are useful. And that's why we've got so many of these models that I showed on the previous slide. Some of them are more useful in some situations than others. And it basically, you need an experienced modeler to know which one should be used where. This is not climate science, so our models are allowed to be wrong and be useful. Another concept is that multiple models should lead to roughly the same answer. If you are doing a design or you're doing some de-bottlenecking, it's a good practice to run multiple different models with different calibrations to make sure that what you're seeing is reproducible in the models. If you're in a situation where you have two models giving very different results, it's a sign that you probably don't have uh, a, a situation that is normal. You might be outside of the calibration data set of some of these models. And being outside of that calibration space is very dangerous. When you run into this situation where models don't agree, one thing you can do is choose the most conservative model and do your design or do your optimization based on that model. But what constitutes the most conservative model will change depending on what you're actually trying to do. So one example is a financial model of a project. You'll want to use the model that gives you the lowest throughput through the mill because that is the possibility that could negatively impact your financial situation. If you're doing a pump or a pipe design, you're actually looking for a conservative model that gives you the highest throughput because you want to make sure that the pump and the pipe are capable of handling the worst case situation, which is the maximum flow situation. So if you've got two models that give you different throughputs that you're going to see in your circuit, the conservative model will be different for the financial model than for the pump and the pipe design. The first large class of models we'll talk about are kind of collectively known as the power models. 
These are the simplest models that are used quite commonly to describe grinding in, um, in an industrial sense. And what it relates to is the specific energy consumption, which is E in the equation that's shown. And specific energy consumption is equal to the power draw of the motor expressed as the mechanical power at the shell of the mill divided by the throughput of the circuit in terms of tons per hour of finished product. And finished product should equal the, uh, the fresh feed, obviously, otherwise you've got something building up somewhere. So the specific energy consumption is usually measured in terms of the units, kilowatt hours per ton, which quite sensibly is just the power divided by tons per hour. The throughput in tons per hour, that should be the dry tons per stream hour of feed, either fresh feed or finished product. The comminution industry uses quite a wide variety of models. And they're, again, they're used for slightly different purposes, but they can fall into basically four major categories. The arrow right now is pointing at the power draw models. This is the model of how much power or how much torque should be generated by the charge of a particular geometry inside of a mill of a particular geometry rotating at a particular angular velocity. So the power draw models are one of the, the useful things when you're trying to decide whether or not your mill is capable of drawing all of the motor power if you're an operator. And if you're a designer, you want to run these models to make sure that the motor you buy for the mill that you've bought is of the right size to drive that mill. The models are all empirical. There's a bunch of them out there. One of the most common is the Morel C model. There's a Hogg and Furstenau model. There's an Austin model for sag milling. There's a Nordberg model typically used for ball milling. All of them operate in much the same way that you, you generate a model of the charge of the mill, some sort of a geometric model, and it can be based on, you know, arcs of material in contact that are rotating contrary to each other with a friction factor between the different sectors of the arcs. Whatever the geometry is, the authors of the models have calibrated that model to a, a database of industrial mills. And so this allows us to pick a mill geometry and a charge geometry and a mill rotating speed and then work out what the power draw should be for that geometry of a mill. So in a design sense, you would use that to pick a motor that is bigger than what the, the power draw model says that mill will draw. And in an operating sense, you can use the model to tell you if you can ever reach the power uh, capability of the motor, because if the designers have chosen the motor right, it should be bigger than what you can actually draw from it. So that tells you the maximum power you should be able to draw for your existing ball mill or sag mill if you run it right to the maximum conditions. We'll now move on to the specific energy models. And these are models that predict the E in the equation we showed on an earlier slide. And it's used in conjunction with the power draw models to do your mill designs for a brand new circuit. This E term is used to represent the specific energy required to break a rock to a desired size. So it includes things like the ore hardness as a measurement of some sort. The specific energy can be measured both in an operating plant on an operating mill, and it can be predicted from laboratory tests. The correlation between these two is empirical, just like all these other models. Um, the specific energy consumption is also a factor of the feed size and the product size that you want to generate. So a specific energy is only going to tell you the energy required to go from a specified feed size to a specified product size. The original forms of these types of equations, such as the, the bond family of equations, 
they assume that particle size distributions look normal. And a normal size distribution from whatever your mill is, whatever your comminution device is, should have roughly the same, roughly the same shape in a log-log plot space. This slide from Bepswa and all shows an example of the feed to a sag mill, which are the two curves on the far right, and the overflow of the hydrocyclones on the far left with the product of the sag mill shown in the two curves that are in the, in the center. And what you can see in, in a very um, high level form is that the curve for the feed is roughly parallel to the curve for the cyclone overflow, but the sag products, particularly the blue survey, the slope is quite a bit different in the sag product when compared to the cyclone overflow and the sag feed. So this is the property that causes some headaches to designers when we're dealing with sag mills, is that you can't use just a single particle size to represent an entire family of curves. You have to adjust for the, the variation in these slopes. One thing that you can do is try and correct the measured particle size distributions of a sag or ag mill to make a synthetic normal product size. And, and one of the techniques we use for doing that is the phantom cyclone. And this is the technique that's used in the bond type models and in the morel type models, the, um, the MI type models for morel. Another way that you can treat this is to come up with a new class of tests and models where the specific energy model is empirically matched to the odd particle size distribution that comes out of the mill. So you end up with a, a model such as the SAG design or the SGI designs, where the SAG mill is treated differently to all the other comminution equipment that has this property of the parallel, um, the parallel PSDs feed to product. So you can't use an SGI or a SAG design equation to size a ball mill. They, they only work for SAG and AG mills. Bond models are a class of models that uh, use a parameter called a work index along with the particle size of the feed, the F80, and the particle size of the product, the P80, to predict what the specific energy consumption is. So the work index in a design situation would normally be developed from lab tests. In an industrial sense, you can measure the specific energy consumption of an industrial machine and then compute what the operating work index of the machine is. And that has the benefit that it takes out any variations in the P80 and the F80 when you're trying to compare how well the grinding circuit is working or how hard the ore is when these other parameters are varying as well. This model was empirical and it was generated by Fred Bond and it often goes by the name the third theory because there were two other models that were in existence at the time that Fred Bond came up with his model. And Bond's model was generated by plotting a bunch of specific energy consumptions on log log paper and they noticed a trend that where in this log log space, you could draw a regression line through that data set that had an exponent of about minus one half. Now, an exponent of minus one half, of course, that's equal to one over the square root of a term. And that's where the, the square roots in this equation comes from. That is an empirical fitting of the exponent observed in Bond's data set. Now, work index you should treat it as a unitless empirical parameter. It's common in the industry to give it the same units as specific energy consumption, and that can lead to a whole host of problems when people try uh, adding work indexes. These, these are not additive. So if you treat them as a unitless 
parameter, you won't make the mistake of trying to add them together because clearly they don't have units that are additive. Uh, work index can be on a metric ton basis or on a short ton basis. Um, typically only the U.S. still uses the imperial short ton basis. Uh, in some of the, the literature going back, there's also uh, long tons were used in the U.S. iron industry. Almost everybody now uses the convention of metric tons, so we don't need to be so concerned about which units are. You can just say the work index is 12 metric units rather than saying 12 kilowatt hours per ton. Because if you tell somebody that's the work index, they might try and add it to the specific energy consumption of, let's say, the sag mill it might be five kilowatt hours per ton. But you can't add a specific energy consumption to a work index. So that's why I am pushing the notion that work index should be in an empirical parameter, although most authors in the industry assign it the same units of work in uh, of specific energy consumption which does lead to a lot of confusion. There is not just one work index. There's actually five of them. And I've got a video on YouTube that specifically describes what these five are. What we're going to talk about here, though, is just the, the three of them that are measured in the laboratory. So there is a crushing work index test, which occurs on rocks, um, you know, kind of a 75 millimeters to 100 millimeters in, in nominal dimension. There's a rod mill work index, which you feed it samples approximately 10 millimeters in size, and it takes those down to around about a millimeter. And then there's the bond ball mill work index test that goes from about 2.4 millimeters down to, you know, and as the operator, you can decide how far you go down, but it's, it's commonly between about 75 micrometers to 200 micrometers. The fact that there are three different work index tests done in the laboratory should give you a clue that work index changes as a function of size. The final class of models that we'll talk about in this presentation are the population balance models. Two of the platforms that are most commonly used in the industry that fit into this category are the JK SimMet package that comes from Australia and Mollycop Tools, which comes from Chile and Peru. Population balance models are the most complicated of the models that I'm going to discuss in the presentation, and they require matrix math or linear algebra. The way that they work is based on a, a series of time intervals where at each time interval, you do a mass balance at all of the size classes that are under consideration. So the vector contains the quantity of material that is in, in the mill charge in a particular time interval, where each row in the, in the vector is the quantity of material in a particular size. So each size makes one row. The mathematics also includes a, a matrix that you multiply by this vector, and that describes the, the frequency by which a particular size class will break. And we already saw an example of some breakage rate curves in an earlier slide. When you multiply the, the breakage rate vector by the um, by the, the mill contents vector, you end up with the number of particles that are going to break within a particular iteration of the model. You then multiply that by an appearance matrix, which describes how each size class breaks into all of its daughter products. And so this is a lower triangular matrix that shows how a particle of a particular size breaks into a bunch of particles of smaller sizes. These then um, have a, a classification function is applied at the end of each time step to, to move uh, finished material out of the model and replace with fresh feet. And then the model repeats and it continues until it reaches a steady state. These models have a lot of degrees of freedom. 
it's got, um, you know, these matrices can be, you know, 32 by 32 rows and, and columns in size. <clears throat> and each one of these values is something that needs to be measured. They are best used for modeling an existing mill because when you model an existing mill, you can bring in lots and lots and lots of data to help constrain the models. In a design setting, they're much more difficult to use because there are so many unknowns. You don't know how to populate these uh, appearance matrices and breakage rate vectors. And they can, they, they don't necessarily lead to one unique solution if you haven't applied enough constraints to the model. The first of the population balance platforms that we'll talk about is the JK SINMET uh, platform. Its approach is to use a breakage rate vector that has been measured from an industrial machine and to assume that that is a machine characteristic. So you can take one of the, the lines from the chart that you see on the screen and that you can use that um, when you're doing uh, another design project if you consider the mills to be suitable. You can just transfer that um, that curve across to the next project. And then the appearance matrix in the JK SINMET approach, it comes from laboratory test work. So you, you run something called a JK drop weight test, which operates in a size class roughly analogous to the bond rod mill work index. And you generate a, a curve out of this test data which goes into a bunch of regression equations that the JKMRC have fitted over the years. And you, with that, you, basically with two numbers, you can generate an entire appearance function based on some laboratory data. So that's the key thing with JK SIMMET. You take the, uh, uh, the appearance matrix is generated by test work, but the breakage rate vector has to come from an industrial survey somewhere. The next population balance platform that we will look at is Mollycock Tools. This is a large series of uh, Excel spreadsheets. Some of them have programming in them and some of them are just straight spreadsheets. But the population balance component, we don't take the breakage rate vector directly out of a survey you construct it out of three components. You can see on the screen here that the red line is the breakage rate vector that is computed out of three other lines. There's a straight line you see, which is the self-breakage, which we talked about in one of the first slides. The upper blue curved line, that is the breakage associated with balls hitting rocks. And then the, the lower black curved line, that is the breakage associated with rocks hitting rocks. So that's the autogenous breaking, breakage line. In the Mollycock Tools platform, what you do is you adjust the amount of these three types of breakage to suit your particular situation. And then you add the three of them together to, to make a composite breakage rate vector, which in the language of Mollycock tools, it's actually called a selection function. So the specific selection function in Mollycock tools is effectively the same thing as what I'm describing as a breakage rate vector, just in a different nomenclature. Now we'll talk for a bit about mill design. What, the first thing you want to do when you design a mill for a new ore is do get a hardness fingerprint for the ore, because that's going to dictate which breakage mechanisms are most important for your ore. Any ore will have a particular way that it wants to break, and the most efficient way to break it is to exploit those preferences. Measure the work index of your ore at different sizes, such as we see in the diagram here, where you'll have a crushing work index as your coarsest size and ball milling work indexes as your finest sizes. The choice of whether or not to add pebble crushing usually comes down to two things. One is, are you looking for a coarse product or a fine product? Fine products are not really a good match for pebble crushing circuits. The second thing is to look at the work index range. 
if you have a situation where the ball mill work index is less than the rod mill work index and possibly the crushing work index, that's a suggestion you're going to have a large circulating load of pebbles and you might be overwhelmed unless you install a pebble crusher. The choice of whether you go with a sag mill or an ag mill can usually come down to two points as well. The split between capital costs and operating costs are different, where an ag mill has a higher capital cost and lower operating costs, but ag milling also requires that the ore be amenable, and amenable in the sense of autogenous milling is that the mill will hold a charge and doesn't run empty. This slide shows an example of an ag amenable ore from an iron project in Canada. The key thing is you can see that the coarse size range where the crushing work index dominates is higher than the rod mill work index range, which is in the middle of these charts. So what that means is that the mill will contain a charge of grinding media of this iron ore. If you don't see this kind of a pattern, if you see a low crushing work index that is less than the rod mill work index, that's a hint that the coarse material in your mill is all going to break, and then you'll be left with an empty mill with no grinding media in it, and it will not be able to grind ore autogenously. The final topic that we'll cover is motors, because big grinding mills need big motors, and you as an, un as an engineer dealing with mills need to understand a bit about motors. The largest motors that are available for grinding mills are gearless or they're also called wraparound drives. And these are available up to about 28 megawatts in size. For smaller mills with smaller motors, you can go to gear drives and the motors that attach to gear drives, those usually come in two forms. There's a synchronous motor where the speed of the motor is a multiple of the line frequency of the power that's coming in. The second type of motor is an induction motor where the speed of the motor slips a little bit from what would be expected from the synchronous speed, which is the multiple of the line frequency. Induction motors tend to have a lower capital cost, but they also have a lower electromechanical efficiency, usually. Um, synchronous drives will give you a, a higher electromechanical efficiency, uh, but they'll be slightly more expensive. The most expensive will be the gearless drives, but because they lack any gears, they're actually the, the highest electromechanical efficiency of the different types of mill motors. This photo shows an example of a grinding circuit with one large sag mill, which you see on the left, and the yellow ring that you see wrapped around the mill, that is the gearless motor. Under the, the yellow structure is the stator of the motor, and the rotor poles of the motor are physically attached to a flange on the end of the sag mill. A little farther back on the right-hand side, you can see two ball mills. And these ball mills are each driven by a pair of motors, and those motors have gearboxes on them. And you can tell if you see gearboxes, those are probably induction motors rather than synchronous motors. So this photo shows one gearless sag, two gear-driven ball mills, where each ball mill has a pair of um, in induction motors with gearboxes. When talking about mill motors, it's very important to understand that power changes depending where you are measuring things in the drive network. Most of the control systems measure the electrical power that's going into a motor or going into the drive in a cabinet somewhere near the mill. The motor plaque that shows you what the rated power is, that rated power is not the electrical input power, it's the output mechanical power of the shaft of the mill. When a mill has a drive that includes gears, there's going to be a mechanical power loss across those gears. 
So it's important to understand when you're talking about power, which kind of power, is it electrical or is it mechanical, and where in the network are you measuring that relative to. All of the equations I showed you in the modeling section are relative to the shell of the mill or the pinion gear that drives the shell of the mill. Most plants, as I described, you will see an indication of the electrical power. So you need to use diagrams like the one on the screen to convert between what you're reading on the control system to what the mechanical power is at the mill shell that's doing the actual work for you. To use this diagram, you will choose the appropriate column for the type of motor that you've chosen. So this example, I've highlighted the uh, synchronous motor with a gear. And then you go from the point where you are making the measurement to the point where you want to, to con correct the power relative to. And then you multiply all of these losses as you go up or down this, this column. So the way that you combine the electrical efficiency and the mechanical efficiency is by multiplication. The motor nameplate that is uh, attached in the factory contains some important information, such as the voltage that is expected on the input leads to the motor. You can use some of this information when you're trying to do the conversion between the motor input electrical power and the output power for when you're doing things like diagnosing um, whether or not you have, uh, you're drawing the full power out of the motor. So in this example, I've got a photo of a nameplate that has um, a cos phi value. This is a power factor which applies to synchronous motors and to gearless motors. You can compute what the KVA of the motors are, and I'm not going to explain what that is. If you take an electrical engineering course on AC motors, you'll know what that is. Uh, the key thing is you can work out from this what the motor efficiency is for when you're, um, instead of using the charts you saw on the previous diagrams, you can input your actual motor's efficiency computed using information that is usually presented on the motor nameplate. So I'll wrap up the presentation just by quickly reviewing that tumbling mills provide a cost-effective way of grinding high tonnages of minerals that need to be comminuted. Mills are combined into circuits to maximize efficiencies. You choose a sag mill or an ag mill because it's efficient at grinding coarser particles. You choose a ball mill because it's efficient at grinding finer particles. If you have a very capital-constrained project, you might forego the grinding efficiency and just install one single stage sag mill if you're processing a low enough tonnage. There's a whole ecosystem of models that exist to design and optimize grinding circuits. All of these models can be useful, but all of them are wrong. And you must be very, very humble when you're using the models and don't expect reality to match what your mathematics is predicting. Every page in this lecture that I've presented could be a two-day short course provided to professionals. So don't be concerned if you can't follow everything right now. Soak up the buzzwords. Try and pick out the high-level relationships between the concepts. And there's going to be lots of times in your future mining career to fully understand what all these concepts mean. Also, if you, if you have the opportunity, just review this. Um, presentation a couple of times and I expect you'll pick more out of it the second time versus the first time. And with that I would like to say thank you to Dr. Sharaf Kumar for the invitation to speak to you at VKSU in the Department of Mineral Processing at the Postgraduate Center. So best wishes to all of the students in your future careers. I would like to also present that I have uh, LinkedIn pages where I do post quite a bit of grinding related content and I have a full YouTube channel that includes lots of other grinding related concepts and videos. Please click on the, the subscribe button to be uh, plugged into these, these other videos on grinding concepts that I've got. And with that, we hope to see you out there in the industry. Goodbye everyone.